Welcome to In Focus with Ijaz Heather. Tonight we begin with a discussion of the renewed U.S. diplomatic efforts to get a breakthrough in talks between the Taliban and the government in Kabul, Kabul headed by President Ashraf Ghani. United States Special Envoy for Afghan Reconciliation, Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad was in Islamabad yesterday and met with the civilian and military leadership. Khalilzad apprised Pakistan of the review process undertaken by U.S. President Joe Biden's administration. His visit came on the heels of a letter by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken to President Ashraf Ghani. The letter released by various media outlets as a tone of urgency and some would also say a perhaps a veiled threat of withdrawal of U.S. troops by 1st May, as envisaged in the U.S. deal with the Taliban. But even more interestingly, the letter talks about a roadmap to a new inclusive government and the terms of a permanent comprehensive ceasefire in that order. This is a very important development. As we have previously discussed on this program, the intra-Afghan talks have remained stuck on a central issue. The Afghan government negotiating team insists and has been insisting that a ceasefire must be a priority in the talks. While the Taliban have wanted discussion of a ceasefire to come after an agreement on the shape of a future government. Blinken's letter also informs Ghani that Khalil Zad will share with Ghani the proposals prepared by the Biden administration. These proposals are also being shared with other state parties, including Pakistan. The letter also indicated that the U.S. has asked Turkey to host a senior level meeting of both sides to finalize a peace agreement. The draft of U.S. proposals has also been received by the Taliban, as confirmed by spokesman Mohammed Naim. Meanwhile, as we will discuss further in the program, Ghani apparently remains unmoved. How will the new push work? To discuss it, I'm joined by Ambassador Tamina Janjua, former Foreign Secretary, and Mariam Burdak, an Afghan analyst and activist. Thank you to both. Let me begin with Mariam Burdak here. Uh, Mariam, uh, in recent speeches, uh, you know, as you know, President Ghani has been reported uh, to have said that you know, uh, no interim government would be formed as long as I'm alive. And now, after this letter, uh, uh, the first Vice President, Abdullah Saleh, uh, is also reported to have said that the president had received the letter and was unmoved by its contents. He said Ghani was not ready to embrace the Secretary of State's accelerated pace towards a settlement. So give me your sense of, uh, you know, how the situation is likely to pan out because the U.S. push is, is very clear and, and I'm sure you've read Blinken's letter uh, and there is a tone of urgency uh, in that. I think that um, the um, Afghan government is extremely shook, and they assume that if there was a Democrat, a, a, um, Democrats coming into power, that it wouldn't have, they wouldn't have seen such a push, and they would have um, allowed this administration to carry out its uh, term. But I think that it's not about Republicans or Democrats in the United States asking for Afghans to, uh, for the uh, their own troops to exit. I think it has to do with the fact that there has been so many billions of dollars, taxpayer money coming into Afghanistan, and they continue to see that it's not doing any good, and it's the Afghan people that have to continue to reconcile their own differences. Um, I understand that there are other matters at stake here where there are international um, insurgencies that are present in Afghanistan. However, if we do not handle the chunk that is a major concern for us and that is reconciling with the Afghan Taliban, then there will be nothing for Afghanistan in the future. The fact that U.S. taxpayers will continue to fund a government that cannot even secure the capital itself, um, it will not benefit any party. Forcing the Afghan government to really come to terms with the current uh, circumstances is an excellent step. I think that the fact that I have been analyzing that why are Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State, U.S. Secretary of Defense and State, communicating directly with President Ghani after this letter, it obviously shows to term that they're communicating and bypassing their own counterparts because they see that President Ghani is not willing to move for the best of the country. He wants to continue to keep his position. If right. President Ghani seems an right, interim government on. is not going to, he needs to give the reason why. 
I think that he, if uh, any president should look into the well, uh, the interest of its people, and one of the interests here is making sure that we are not losing lives. I remember hearing a number that we we're losing about two to three hundred Afghan National Defense Security Forces daily. That's pretty much an elimination tactic of its population. Right. In this respect, uh, as uh, Secretary Blinken's letter indicates, America's four billion dollar in aid to Afghanistan's national security forces, even if the United States continues funding to the tune of $4 billion, a U.S. withdrawal could mean quick territorial gains for the Taliban. That's what Secretary Blinken said. Um, but, uh, Mariam, stay with me. Let me go to Ambassador Janjua here. Ambassador Janjua, we know that uh, First Vice President Amrullah Saleh has a background. We also know that uh, in all the recent attacks, um, he pointed a finger uh, at the Taliban, uh, even for those attacks that were ultimately claimed by ISIS. Um, but at the same time, it's very clear that he is not playing off his own bat. Uh, President Ghani is very much in the loop and perhaps wants Amrullah Saleh to say things that he would not want to say himself directly. So given that, and given uh, what uh, Mr. Saleh has said about the letter, uh, how do you think it's, it's going to pan out? Well, the letter is one part of what is being discussed and what was brought to uh, Islamabad and to, I understand, no, uh, to uh, Kabul and also shared in Islamabad. There is also these other proposals that are there in uh, allied papers that are supposed to be given to uh, the Afghan government, um, which includes details of how um, the, thing, the peace process uh, is being accelerated by the Biden administration and the Blinken letter is one which is uh, clearly demonstrates that the Biden administration seeks to jumpstart a stall negotiation process and the stall negotiation process as you've indicated had many reasons for it. Uh, one was the fact that there was a new administration that was coming into power in, in uh, Washington. Uh, nevertheless, it's now very clear that the new administration has taken a decision, though the letter says that they are still considering their policy and they have said that all options, Blinken has said that all options are on the table. They are looking at the, at the, at the possibility of pursuing the peace process that was being done under by Ambassador Khalil Zad earlier on. And amongst those, uh, the letter now clearly indicates that there have to be uh, one principle, agreement on principles, which is interesting to note because um, it is this fundamental principles agreement puts pressure not only on the Afghan government, uh, the Ghani government, but also on the Taliban as well to sort of see where they can stand on these guiding principles. Secondly, there is this point of reduction of violence leading to ceasefire, and that's also something. Um, and this one should see in the context of, uh, and it's been written in some of the, the, the media reports coming out of, out of Washington, that they're looking at the uh, to uh, ward off the quote unquote the spring offensive by the Taliban. Uh, hence the the the, uh, the urgency of this proposal, and hence the urgency of asking President Ghani to look at it. Yes, President Ghani has been as as you have indicated indicated has been nonchalant about it, and uh, but. He cannot continue to remain so because there is now just not just the U.S., but there is an effort for a buy-in by all stakeholders because now the U.N. Uh, the U.S. is looking at the participation of bringing forward the the U.N. to lead the process on yeah. some levels, and one of the is uh, one of regional countries, and secondly, the involvement of Turkey as well as the, the conversations move from Doha to Turkey. So it's not going to be easy for the government in Kabul, I understand, to keep um, itself sort of not quite involved in the process. It has to, there will be discussions, there have to be discussions, and, and Ambassador Khalil Zad's recent visit to Kabul must, is indicative of 
that important uh, point. Uh, from our point of view, from Pakistan's point of view, we have to see what the reaction of the Afghan government and the Taliban is. The Taliban have said, indicated that they are looking at the proposal, which is not just the letter, but the, and the, the other parts of the proposal, detailed proposals, which also talks about, and the letter also talks about, constitutional uh, changes in the constitution, etc. And that is something Something that, of course, will require a great deal of hard work because, as President Ghani said, that constitution is sacrosanct for the Afghans. Anyway, and then, of course, there's this talk about uh, a plan for a 90-day uh, reduction in violence leading to ceasefire. So there are several elements in it which need to be looked at before one can take make uh, any kind of a view of where this process is going to go. Uh, Nevertheless, I think it, it is useful to have it on the table because it is indicative of the political new government in uh, the United States' commitment to the peace process. Right. I was actually going to uh, come to uh, the other set of proposals, uh, but you have very eloquently, as always, uh, put that on the table. But uh, just uh, a recap, it's a 90-day reduction in violence. This is incidentally separate from uh, the comprehensive ceasefire that the letter talks about um, in terms of a sequence in which first you get uh, a new government and then you get a comprehensive ceasefire. But this is a 90-day reduction in violence. And both sides would stop fighting within hours of the agreement being signed. Uh, this is according to the draft. The Taliban would remove all its military and military structures from wherever it is, including the neighboring countries, which perhaps is a reference to Pakistan, where uh, lots of the relatives of the leadership uh, reside. Well, let me go back to Mariam Wardak here. Uh, Mariam, uh, the sense that one gets from the letter, and I think uh, this is something that uh, we have discussed on this program previously also, that the, the Biden administration uh, is, is looking at this scene and it thinks that the Ghani administration has been dragging its feet. And therefore, uh, they, they are trying to nudge the Ghani administration. This also comes through in uh, remarks that have come out of Kabul, uh, you know, essentially saying, well, uh, it's, it's not sensible to expedite the process. So that means the Ghani administration does want to soft paddle the whole thing. But clearly the U.S. is now in a hurry. It's been quite some time that President Ghani has been able to come up with a plan of his own um, in this whole time since the discussions in Doha has initiated. The fact that he has not been able to put a, a plan across and has left all the responsibility to the members who are in Doha having conversation and they have come to a stalemate. There is no other process but to have one of our um, most reliable allies uh, support us in drafting a plan. Not to mention the stake that the United States has in this process. Um, Again, we have to look at what the citizens of the United States are looking for and that the, the uh, Biden administration is just acting on behalf of its own people and the people of the United States are asking for their troops to return back home. Right. Uh, Fawzia Kufi was uh, one of the four women uh, at the negotiating table in Doha. Uh, she was speaking to one of the wire agencies and she said that uh, the first May withdrawal of U.S. troops is likely to lead to chaos. Um, and she also confirmed uh, that all sides had received the U.S. crafted draft agreement. Uh, now, it seems to me, Mariam, that Secretary Blinken's reference to the first May withdrawal uh, was a kind of warning shot uh, to President Ghani uh, or perhaps an indication of the fact that the U.S. wants this wrapped up ASAP. But at the same time, the review is probably looking at, because uh, other state actors have also been approached by the United States, uh, with the possibility that perhaps the troop withdrawal timeline could be extended. 
In regards to former member of parliament Fauzi Kufi's comment, um, if you look at the capital, I believe that the capital um, is in no better state. You have about ex uh, explosions in the capital on a daily basis. There are female target killings. Um, when we go to the countryside, there are three to four explosions in uh, multiple provinces on a daily basis. I'm not extremely sure how much more um, issues will arise in the sense when it comes to insecurity. I think Kabul will be the one that will be in chaos um, in the sense that it's where the most freedom is taking place and the fact that there are more foreign expats in the nation. But when it comes to um, uh, the countryside, we have to understand why the Taliban have emerged and continue to, taste, to stay strong. There are Taliban sympathizers in the capital and nationwide. When you look at that aspect, the other threats that could possibly arise is the threat of foreign insurgency that I continue to talk about. We also have to look at the fact that criminality has risen up into the path to the point where people are living in constant fear, whether they're going to be killed by uh, a security incident or they're going to be kidnapped and have their kidneys removed. I don't know which issue to talk about first. This is a political uh, concern. The fact that there are going to be two parties that have been fighting for the past 20 years coming to the table to reconcile, that is an urgency. Intervening in interim government, this could be a possible way for Ghani to come out as a great leader in history, taking this initiation forward and possibly leading it himself. He can take the torch forward. However, he's not. He's resisting. And that is because he enjoys the current position that he holds. Except that uh, the way the situation is unfolding, um he might not be able to hold that position for very long, but I agree with you that uh, this could have been his moment. Uh, but uh, I'm also joined by Ambassador Asif Durrani, a former career diplomat. Ambassador Durrani, uh, thank you for being on the program. For you joined us, we're discussing these new developments, the U.S. push for um, a speedy resolution of uh, the crisis in Afghanistan, uh, Turkey has been pulled in, um, a draft proposals have been, you know, sent across to various stakeholders. So give me your uh, sense of uh, where do you think this is heading? Thanks for having me. I think you have rightly used the word American push. Uh, this is what uh, should have been done, because if you look at it, uh, these uh, uh, talks uh, have been stalled between uh, Taliban and the Ashwagandhi government. And uh, uh, it has not moved except for uh, talking about uh, the modalities. Uh, they have not yet uh, agreed on the full agenda. It's going to be around 21-point agenda, but how they go about it is yet to be seen. So I think uh, 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 Secretary of State uh, Blinken's letter uh, underlines those uh, concerns. First is that uh, they have to have an intra one dialogue. And second is that uh, Taliban have to agree to a three-month uh, violence re reduction, uh, which means that they will uh, not launch uh, spring uh, operations in the country. So these are the two major ones. Subsequent, yes, then uh, 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 U.S. wants that now Turkey should be the venue where these intra one dialogue uh, should take place. And then, uh, of course, uh, uh, U.N. should come into uh, and play its role, because so far, uh, U.N. has been playing a subsidiary role because the Americans were leading the charge. But now they think that uh, because of the immediate neighbors of Afghanistan and also uh, by including India uh, they they want to give it, uh, I think, uh, a new uh, way. Well, how should I say? Is, uh, is because uh, on one hand, America has balanced it out. Uh, probably with Pakistan, there may be some reservations about India, but they have also removed their own reservations about Iran. So that's why, uh, coming from um, uh, Secretary of State. 
about inclusion of uh, India and Iran uh, in, in the proposed UN mandated talks. I think that means a lot. And uh, I think that is, in a way, America is now shifting the responsibilities to the UN and to the immediate neighbors. Now, yes, I'm, I'm very happy you mentioned this. Uh, I, I was ultimately going to get to this, but let me take this to uh, Ambassador Janjua here. Ambassador Janjua, inclusion of Iran and India, how do you look at that? Well, inclusion of Iran, I believe, is a necessity because it's a neighbor. It has close proximity, it has borders with Afghanistan, and therefore inclusion of Iran is something that would perhaps also help the process. And it's a, it's a, it's an important uh, inclusion, as Asif has pointed out, because after all, considering the relations with, with Iran, the U.S. relations with Iran, this is significant, and it will play, it can play, an important role. Um, the point that we need to remember is that as far as Pakistan is concerned, we cannot lose sight of our grand strategic objective, which is a peaceful, stable Afghanistan. And to this is tied our, our economy, our trade, our, our communication links with the Central Asian republics, and many other things. And the fact that peace and peace in Afghanistan will bring a very important effect within uh, for Pakistan and for other countries in the region. As far as India is concerned, we have always had in the past difficulties with where India would stand in a, such a peace process. Let's not forget that India has been playing the, the role of a, of a spoiler in Afghanistan and has not necessarily supported the, the peace process um, as in Doha. It has wanted to keep the pot boil, boiling, but it must now, it is important for the United States to realize that they must, if they want inclusion of India in any such process, minimize India's spoiler role, be conscious of what India was is capable of doing. And uh, I must say, I'm, I'm sure the Indians were surprised with this move as well, but pleased as well, because they've been desperately trying to be on the table on, on whereas Afghan talks are concerned. But uh, for Pakistan, it is a matter of, of concern. Yet for us, we must convey to the US very clearly that the role, if India is to be there, it must, its role as a spoiler must be minimized to minimize as far as possible. And that if with, uh, as far as Pakistan is concerned, Pakistan is a very important a strategic position with the vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan and its role is significant. Uh, if the U.S. insists on having India at the table, and of course there's background to all of this, the fact that India has been con has been called a part of, of U.S. Pivot Asia policy, uh, but we, as I said earlier, we need to use all our convincing powers to to tell the U.S. That for you or for India to sit at the table, they must not act as spoilers. We should, as I said, our strategic objective is a peaceful uh, Afghanistan, a develop, peaceful developing Afghanistan, and we should not lose that objective by focusing on these minor items like India's participation. Right. Um, I also want to get your sense um, on what Mariam Vardik talked about, which is criminality, you know, uh, assassinations, kidnapping, drugs. Uh, these are issues that somehow, because, you know, there is the, the bigger sort of issue of uh, talks between the Taliban and the government, they kind of get swept under the carpet, but these are real issues. Um, and I would like to get your take on this, because it, it also shows very clearly that uh, the current Kabul government even within Kabul, even within the green zone in Kabul, has often been unable to provide security to the common people. Right. Mariam is right in pointing out that even in Kabul, there are all these difficulties of criminality, etc. But in the rest of Afghanistan, because the president of Afghanistan is the president of Afghanistan and not of Kabul, and he should be able to provide security to the rest of the Afghans as well. And that, it appears, is not happening. And you rightly point out, and Mariam points out about the criminality aspect, 
in, in Kabul itself. This is because of the chaos that's a cre that is created. This is because not just the, uh, the Taliban are there as opponents, quote unquote opponents of the Afghan government, but because there are many other miscreants and many other terrorist groups and organizations that ply in Afghanistan. And that's a matter of immense concern for us as well, for us. As I said earlier, peaceful Afghanistan, a peaceful Kabul, the peaceful uh, uh, Kabul, uh, rest of the country is a critical for Pakistan. We are there, we live with this every day. So it is important for us that the international community seizes the, the difficulties, uh, seizes all opportunities to ensure that difficulties created within Afghanistan, can, within Kabul and Afghanistan can be dealt with and yes, it has been said repeatedly that even the small enclave that President Ghani holds in, a, in Kabul does not necessarily, uh, is not necessarily free of crime and, and all kind of uh, acts that, are, that greatly affect the lives of the Afghans. And that is important to deal with. Right. Thank you so much. That was Ambassador Tamina Janjua speaking with us. Let me go back to Bariam Vardak. Bariam, two questions. One, uh, Amrullah Saleh, uh, in addition to being first vice president, is also charged with the security of Kabul. And I think he has singularly failed in that duty. Uh, the, the other issue has to do with uh, the, you know, the support that the United States provides to the Afghan National Security Forces and also the direct budgetary support that comes from monies uh, from the U.S. and U.S. allies. So given that, uh, how much resistance do you think the Ghani administration can offer uh, in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, telling the United States, well, we don't want to be on board with this, this draft proposal of yours? I think President, uh, Vice President uh, Amr Allah Saleh's speech was pretty much a statement um, underlying we don't want to be on board with this and the fact that the document was leaked was a clear indication. I think that um, we have to look at, we always have to reflect on history. In Afghanistan, cultural precedence takes over anything else. The fact that Amr Allah Saleh had taken over the security of Kabul and all of a sudden there has been a huge shift when it came to respecting uh, political leaders to now um, officers disrespecting um, political leaders, there was a huge uh, frack, uh, disturbance in Kabul. There are leaders like um, the, the Gilanis, for instance, all of a sudden there was security concerns for them due to the fact that Amrullah Saleh decided to strip all of the leaders of um, their own personal security. The fact that Amrullah Saleh thinks that he knows best by taking political leaders' security away from them, he doesn't realize that he's actually turning the allies that he has within the countries against him. He is so disconcerned by continuing what Afghans are known for, which is respecting one another and trying to make himself as the new leader um, in the security in institutions, I think that's false. When he took over the security of Kabul, you've basically stripped the responsibilities of the Minister of Interior. That is showing that you have no confidence within your own cabinet. So again, there's a disruption within the Ghani administration itself. So, in addition to the fact that the Afghan parliament is not working very well with the Ghani administration. So you have your allies that you've turned against you. You don't have much confidence in your own cabinet. The Afghan parliament is against you. You're also fighting the war against foreign insurgents. You're trying to keep uh, Afghanistan safe from criminality. And you are fighting the front lines against the Afghan Taliban. You are stretched way too, thin, way too thin, and you need to reflect on the current realities of this. Now, we, there was a recent article in the Washington Post highlighting certain challenges that the Afghan National Defense Security Forces are going through. The fact that there is not that many airstrikes, many bases have been left empty. There is, as much as our Afghan National Defense Security Forces are brave, really strong soldiers, they are stretched very thin. And the fact yeah. that they are stretched thin, you 
look at the psychological, emotional, physical damages that it's causing on the individual. When you tire out your own soldiers, there is no defense for you because they're too exhausted to fight. And people forget to look at the, the simple things such as this. We can't discuss policies anymore. It's really what the ground reality is calling for. Absolutely. And we, I, uh, absolutely, Mariam. Um, uh, so much for being with me and for your insights. Um, I'm also joined by Rahimullah Yusufzai, who is the resident editor of the News in Peshawar. Uh, Mr. Yusufzai, we, we were discussing the Blinken letter and, and uh, you know, the draft uh, proposals that have been received by the Taliban also, by uh, Pakistan and other state actors also. So it seems to me that uh, the Biden administration now is very serious about pushing this through and there is a great sense of urgency. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, you know, I think these are the first uh, indications of the uh, review which was taking place. They haven't publicly announced uh, you know, their new policy. But, you know, these are new steps uh, which have been proposed by the U.S. through Zalmay Khalilzad and through Antony Blinken. And I think these are very significant proposals. Uh, there's a sense of urgency, yes. Uh, you know, they want to pull out, but they don't want to pull out without leaving something stable, something workable in Afghanistan in terms of the peace process. So I believe that, you know, for example, this conference of uh, these, uh, you know, regional uh, world powers, uh, that is very important. For example, the UN is being involved. Yeah. The conference may be held in Bonn, Germany. So Russia, China, uh, Pakistan, uh, Iran for the first time, you know, the US seeking Iran support as well because they are realized without Iran's cooperation, uh, you won't be able to stabilize Afghanistan and India. You know, uh, even if India is a spoiler, they have a role and they should be involved. Because, and now all these countries have their, uh, you know, uh, reservation, their uh, concern regarding Afghanistan. Some are threatened by militants based there. Some are threatened by drugs, uh, you know, produced in Afghanistan and smuggled. Uh, and, you know, some are threatened by the presence of foreign troops. So I think their concerns should will also be taken into account. And then they can cooperate fully to try to stabilize Afghanistan. That's, I think, a very significant step. And the Americans have realized they can't do it alone. They right. need the support of these countries in the right. region. Right. Uh, very quickly, uh, Ambassador Durrani, because I have to wrap up also. Um, uh, why Turkey? And the other concern can be, you get too many state actors, are you getting too many cooks that are going to spoil the broth? In fact, uh, Turkey has a history. It has been involved in Afghanistan. And uh, if you recall, uh, uh, in fact, uh, among those but especially those some, they have been taking refuge in Turkey. So uh, Turkey has a very substantive presence in the north of Afghanistan. They have established many, many schools there, uh, universities they have established. And uh, I think uh, Turkey, in a way, it suits Pakistan also. And then if Turkey is the venue for the intra afghan dialogue, it's not for the UN uh, uh, supervised dialogue, but uh, intra afghan dialogue. And in that way, I think uh, now uh, Biden administration also wants to come closer to Turkey, which earlier they had strained relationship during uh, Trump's time. So that is another factor which is playing out. And then uh, when you talk about these, uh, when uh, uh, India's spoiler role is concerned, I think India would remain a spoiler, much uh, bitter a spoiler if they are outside the tent. If they okay. are in the tent, then I think they okay. have to own the responsibility. Right. Thank you so much. That was Ambassador Asif Durrani. Thank you also to Rahimullah Yusufzai for speaking with us. We shall take a short break and return to discuss the ongoing protests in Myanmar. Stay with us. Welcome back to In Focus. Myanmar continues its slide into further chaos. Hundreds of Myanmar protesters barricaded within one district in the city of Yangon 
have been allowed to leave after an overnight standoff which saw police and other government troops violently cracking down on anti-government demonstrations, detaining dozens and reportedly breaking into homes to question residents. Images posted on social media showed individuals in handcuffs surrounded by police and security forces in combat uniform. Nearly 60 protesters have been killed by security forces since the first February coup. At least two diplomats, Myanmar's permanent representative to the United Nations and its ambassador to the United Kingdom, have broken ranks with the military government and called for the release of Aung San Suu Kyi and other political leaders. To discuss the situation further, I am joined by Ne San Luen, who is a Rohingya activist and blogger, and Hena Zuberi, editor-in-chief of MuslimMatters.org. She also leads the DC office of the human rights organization Justice for All. Let me begin with Mr. Luen here. Mr. Luen, um, there was the, obviously, uh, the Rohingya question uh, still hangs in balance, um, but now Myanmar has another problem. Uh, so give me a sense of where things are headed. Yeah, as all of you know that uh, this since the first February coup, as you mentioned earlier, uh, more than 16 have been killed. Yesterday, they blocked the young protester in in, in the town uh, and arrested uh, uh, more than 50 young protester. But today morning, uh, those who were uh, under blockade, they were free. And in every you know uh, town. Across the country, there are protests against the, this military coup. Uh, Sometimes they are using, but most of the time, they are using the real bullet and also throwing the, this uh, uh, tear gas and the sound bomb. So at night, you know, they are raiding the houses and, you know, arresting the people. So uh, the country is, you know, uh, in the country, no one is safe at all. So that is the reason, you know, uh, that the uh, people in Myanmar, they want R2P from the United Nations responsibility to protect, but which is not going to happen because, you know, uh, this Russia and the China will always veto uh, any resolution uh, against the uh, this uh, Myanmar military. So these people are completely unprotected. They should be protected protected by any main uh, necessary at this moment. And for the Rohingya, Rohingya are, you know, really terrified after the, this coup. And uh, uh, we are re uh, very much concerned that, uh, you know, this military chief, May Aung Lai, has said uh, Rohingya crisis is unfinished business from the uh, World War II. Uh, he has already uh, wiped up more than a million population and the remaining uh, 600,000 in Rakhine State, they are at risk. Uh, he can launch the, another round of violence at any time and wipe up the, the remaining population. That is what we are worried. Now, Ms. Zuberi, one of the ironies here is that uh, Ms. Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, in trying to save her position and office, went along with the military's purge of Rohingya. And yet, ultimately, nothing could save her. So there is a bit of uh, irony here, deep or sweet, uh, if you will, depending on how one looks at it. But give me your sense of uh, where you think the situation is headed. Um, yes, you are exactly right that this um the Aung San Suu Kyi has had joined hands with the same genocidal military, had uh, had denied the Rohingya genocide, and now the same military has turned their backs towards her. But it, what is wonderful to see is that the people on the streets have not given up on democracy. They are they haven't given up on the idea of a free and diverse Burma. One thing that has come out of this is the recognition by by people, some people, not a lot of uh, uh, Burmese or uh, people of Myanmar, that uh, that they should have stood by the Rohingya uh, during this genocide, and they they have apologized for not speaking up um, earlier. Um, and so we really have a hope that uh, I mean, but we have to uh, we have a hope in the people. But this military, no one can forget, is the same genocidal military um, and is attacking not only Rohingya 
Rohingya, and uh, the, we're scared for the Rohingya as well, but also for the Kachin and the Karen and the other diverse uh, ethnic minorities in the north. So, um, and with Aung San Suu Kyi, we need to have other, uh, and we are seeing other uh, democratic leaders emerge from uh, from the people of Burma. We need to stop concentrating on Aung San Suu Kyi. Even here in the United States, um, Mitch, um, Senator Mitch McConnell, who was the head uh, of the party, um, of the Republican Party lead senator here uh, was anti, you know, any movement over here to help the Rohingya, to help uh, the Kachin and the Karen had been blocked by Mitch McConnell throughout the Trump administration. And now we're seeing, this, seeing the same Mitch McConnell come back and uh, stand up in support of the Burmese people. And it's so unfortunate that both him and, uh, and he's very good friends with Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, but we really, really believe that this is about the people of Burma. Uh, new leadership needs to emerge and the focus needs to be away from Aung San Suu Kyi uh, because this is not just about her. A very, very interesting point. Um, I also have to wrap up, but let me quickly take it back to Nessan Lwin. Uh, Mr. Lwin, uh, uh, Ms. Zuberi is making this very interesting point about A, we have to sort of, you know, uh, shift the focus from Ms. Suu Kyi to new leadership that's emerging. And the second very interesting point that she made is that, uh, you know, now with this crackdown, uh, the majority uh, Burmese are now realizing uh, that perhaps they should have stood up for the Rohingya also. Yeah, they are now realizing the Rohingya genocide and some uh, Burmese uh, uh, tweeted over the Twitter, uh, they are apologizing the Rohingya. And also, they also send me the uh, private message under my Facebook post. The um, uh, hundred of these Burmese people are apologizing the Rohingya, but uh, some are still remain safe. In the country, uh, most of the people are slowly moving to the right direction. The biggest problem in the country is the 2008 constitution created by the military. Now, most of the people are uh, uh, saying that we have to have the new constitution and this one should be abolished. And the, the committee representing Pidon Zuludo, I mean, the parliament uh, uh, just, you know, uh, uh, formed after the military coup, they, they have also uh, released a statement that, you know, this constitution sh must be abolished and get the new one. So once we have the new constitution, I believe that there will be the human right for all, justice for all, and the equality for all. So in this time, well, we need to campaign to end the racism against the Rohingya, you know, the hatred against the Rohingya, because, you know, this is uh, the, this is the problem in the country since 1962. Absolutely. Racism is deeply rooted in the country. So uh, we cannot solve this problem overnight, but, you know, we have to campaign properly. But now, you know, that since the young people called Generation Z are taken to the street and they are broad-minded and like the other, you know, the elderly people in the country. So I am, I am really expecting that this country will change if they go in the right direction. Uh, and also they are moving to the right direction slowly, as I mentioned earlier. Right. Uh, okay, I need to go back to Ms. Zuberi before I wrap up. Uh, now, Ms. Zuberi, uh, the very powerful Myanmar military, and especially the generals in the junta, they rely on businesses. They have uh, external business partners, uh, and they also rely on arms supplies, obviously, uh, from external sources. So just give me a sense of uh, who those partners are. Um, so this is really important. India has emerged as the largest arms dealer, ar arms supplier of the junta, of the uh, Burmese military. Um, Israel is another arms dealer. Russia, there needs to be, and there's a call for a um, global arms embargo to Myanmar, uh, particularly because of the way that they had, are treating, um, they are at war against their own people. So this is extremely Extremely important, especially India's role is key. Um, the nexus of 
India and Burma um, being involved uh, in and and, on, uh, and in uh, the persecution of their own people is something that many human rights organizations are standing up against. This embargo should be accompanied by robust monitoring and enforce mechanism. This is the ask that uh, we have been also asking Human Rights Watch uh, and for, for uh, Fortify First. Uh, Fortify Rights has led this call for a comprehensive arms embargo on Myanmar. Um, and it should... Um, direct and ind on indirect supplies, sales, and transfer of all weapons uh, and military-related equipment, because it's being very, used against the civilians. Very important point. Um, I think there are some reports that suggest this, but let's hope that uh, the, I uh, see some optimism in uh, both uh, Mr. Lewin and Ms. Zuberi's uh, sort of hope for a change. Uh, and I hope that that optimism is uh, is well placed, but thank you to Nesan Lewin, thank you to Hannah Zuberi for being with me on this uh, segment. This is all from In Focus tonight. We shall see you tomorrow at the same time. Keep following our latest updates on social media at indus.news. Good night and goodbye.